Oh my gosh. Hi, everybody. It's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I'm back. I'm back, and it feels so good. I'm so sorry that I've been so absent for the past month, but welcome to my coverage of SpaceX's launch for NASA. They are launching NASA's TESS satellite. That's the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Uh, this thing is tiny. It's only like 350 kilograms or what is that, like 800 pounds or something. Uh, pretty lightweight. Uh, this is going into a really weird orbit that uh, has like a lunar resonance. So like it goes out into this weird, highly elliptical orbit. It's it's crazy. It's really smart. It's a really clever orbit. Um yeah, it's really cool. This is kind of a precursor to the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's going to be looking for exoplanets and looking for them to be transiting in front of stars. And then it's going to map the whole sky, basically, and help give us a good understanding of where we need to be pointing the James Webb Space Telescope when it goes online here, hopefully next year. Uh, I'm really, really excited about it. Um, this is a cool mission. Uh, it's also the lightest, I, I believe this is the lightest thing that the Falcon 9 has ever launched. This is a small satellite. It... As a matter of fact, I think NASA was even looking into just using the Pegasus air launcher by Orbital ATK, which is like a, uh, they use like an L-1011 jet or air launch system, and it's a pretty small rocket. That could have done this, but instead, um, they ended up contracting uh, SpaceX to use their Falcon 9. And this will be landing, this is a new core, it's probably one of the last non-Block 5 cores. If you don't know what that means, I have a video titled, uh, Block Changes, like what's the difference between block four, block five, all that stuff. We kind of go through the history of the block changes. Um, so if you want to know kind of why block five is exciting, it's going to be ushering in that new rapid reusability and hopefully seeing cores fly more than just once and then again, refurbished and then again, hopefully we'll see cores fly about 10 times before there's any refurbishment and hopefully almost 100 times before the end of their lifetime. So it's going to be sweet. Um, this is going to be... Um, Someone asks, why are they launching in the middle of the night? They are not. It has not become night yet where it's launching, which is Florida. So this is taking off um, from Slick 40, SLC 40, which is Space Launch Complex 40. That's at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, where it's not quite night. But we might, guys, this might be one of those launches that ends up being uh, maybe, probably not though, but maybe it'll be one of those uh, Twilight Phenomenon launches where uh, the rocket goes up. And it gets dark enough, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be a gorgeous launch, though. Um, but yeah, this they are landing this, since it is a new core. Um, they are landing it on, the, on, of course, I Still Love You. And it's going to be awesome. And then hopefully the next launch we're going to see is the uh, Banga Bandu Sat 5. Uh, I have no idea if I pronounced that anywhere near right. But that is going to be the first Block 5, and I really hope that happens soon, because I can't wait to see that. So... Um, I think they're working on fairing recovery on this one, but they don't have um, Mr. Stevens, the fairing catcher, out there. Um, but yeah, they are. So I'm I'm pretty excited. So um, also, Chris, hello, thank you. Hi, Tim. What is the difference between a solid rocket motor and a solid solid rocket booster and solid rocket motor? Can I give your friend Jack Trex a shout out? He's a huge fan. Hey, Jack, and thank you, Chris. Um, those two terms are interchangeable typically, um, but boosters, uh, it depends. If someone says strap on boosters, those, those are the ones that will go on the outer kind of rim, uh, along strapped onto your main booster. Um, so you could say like a solid rocket booster and that would kind of infer that they're strapped on, but it also could be, we could also call the first stage of the Falcon 9, that's the primary booster. So you can say that's a booster. But then you could also say solid rocket motor is interchangeable um, kind of with a liquid engine. So it's just kind of typically solids, most people would say motor and engines, most people would say are liquid propellant. So just sort of depends. I don't know. I mean, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I've been gone. I've been working on hashtag secret mission. I don't know if you have been following along on social media. Um if you aren't, you can find me on anywhere, just wherever you want, Everyday Astronaut, uh, except on Twitter, actually. You, you can still search Everyday Astronaut, you'll find me, but uh, you'll find me uh, as Erday Astronaut on Twitter because Everyday Astronaut does not fit, which is ridiculous. So, um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of hashtag secret mission for the past three weeks, basically. Um, my Patreon supporters know exactly what's going on. I think you guys will find out maybe by the end of the week 
or early next week, what that all was about. It was something very big. I'm really excited about it. Um, we have a question that's a good question. We'll talk about that more later, I'm sure. I want to answer some questions for you guys. Um, is the Fal next Falcon Heavy in June? No. I'm telling you that now. I think I actually just read somewhere someone said uh, SpaceX might have may have moved it. Um, yeah, so I, I'm expecting, guys, they're going to have to fly Block 5 multiple times before they even consider building the next Falcon Heavy. Because don't forget, the next Falcon Heavy will be based on Block 5 architecture. So it's very unlikely, very, very unlikely that they're going to build something before that's all done and ready to go. And they have high confidence in, in Block 5. So I would expect two or three or four launches of Block 5 before they commit to building the Falcon Heavy. So I would actually be, to be perfectly honest, kind of surprised if we see another Falcon Heavy this year. Sorry for the the yeah the, the buzz kill i i i would say at my earliest would be november is my guess but i would not be surprised if it slips till next year um block five will be about two months from now uh or two weeks from now i'm sorry it's supposed to it's slated for early may but uh i don't know about that either yet so we'll see and richard hi what did i think about elon's first stage recovery you mean second stage recovery party balloon bounce house tweet that was a huge shock to me. I didn't know they were talking about anything or having any plans for second stage recovery. I did a, a video almost a year ago now about second stage recovery. We kind of talk about, I, I was more demonstrating some of the challenges. I wasn't trying to say it's impossible because clearly it's not impossible. The space shuttle was basically an upper stage and it was recoverable. Um, so it's not impossible to recover an upper stage. It just definitely has to have certain um, considerations. One of the biggest considerations is really good heat shielding. And, and it takes, if you don't have a good heat shield and you say you're just to take the stock second stage, you'd have to slow it down so much before it hits the atmosphere uh, in order to be survivable. One of the biggest reasons is heat uh, on reentry goes up by speed. Uh, the heat compared to speed is cubed, not square. So say you go four times faster. That doesn't mean you get, uh, you know, four times as much heat. Nope. You And if it was squared, you'd get 16 times as much heat. Nope. This is cubed. So the relationship is almost 64 times more heat um, upon reentry. That's huge. That's why uh, a lot of consideration needs to be done in order to actually make an upper stage, an orbital velocity stage, recoverable and survivable through reentry. Um, and, yeah, the, the idea of using a balut or some kind of uh, supersonic Heat shield is not new. NASA tested, they had like a supersonic heat shield a couple years ago um, that they were working on because it's it's definitely a consideration for Mars. You're coming in at supersonic speeds through a very thin atmosphere. And the, the upper atmosphere of Earth is very similar to just the atmosphere on Mars. Um, so similar considerations need to be taken. So I wouldn't be surprised if they try it out. It's SpaceX. Of course they'll try it out. They'll probably learn a lot from it. So that's what I think. Um, what will this look like a UFO like the launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base says footy nut guy maybe uh, yeah that's I mentioned kind of qu briefly the twilight phenomena and typically the sun has to either be have set or about to rise um, in order for that to be the case so it has to be kind of dark from where you're viewing SpaceX launches live yes okay I'm gonna pull that up over here uh, also I'm very rusty with all this so I apologize if I make really bad mistakes in today's live stream um yeah so here we have spacex let me know if the volume's okay on that i'm gonna let the music kind of hang out in the background so we might get a little bit of that twilight phenomenon but we will see um <laughs> oh by the way uh code reflector uh you can re-watch that video that i linked in our patreon if you want to know all about hashtag secret mission um and also i think i made an announcement in our discord for announcements but maybe i didn't Ooh, wow why is this stream um literally like 180 144p is anyone else seeing garbage stream on spacex's end because if so we, we can switch over to nasa um, who's also covering it since it is a nasa mission um let's see i could uh I can check that out. What do I think of... Oh, hi, Dennis, and thank you. Uh, what do I think of SpaceX building the BFR uh, in the port of Long Beach? I think that's awesome. It makes sense. They're going to want to keep, you know, their talent and their pool of talent nearby their headquarters, and that's obviously very close. Um, it makes sense. 
I'm surprised though because they are going to have to um, they are gonna have to ship that thing which we've known for a while um, they're gonna have to ship that baby around the Panama Canal over to the you know to their two of their three sh uh, ports or two of their three actually you know what I wonder where they're gonna test fire that I never realized that are they still gonna they might have to test fire where are they gonna do that they're not gonna test fire the BFR at the port they aren't gonna test fire the BFR at McGregor because that's way too far inland. Maybe Boca Chica will have to be their test fire and their who knows? That's I never thought about that. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So that's my thoughts. Um Yeah, we got 1080 back up in the live stream. This is this is all good. So um yeah, 1080, I think we're good to go. So that's what I think about that. I think that's really exciting. I'm um, The new site is also a testing ground. I really can't imagine the port of LA, the Los Angeles port, being acceptable for a 31 engine hot fire stand. I just cannot picture a world where that's going to be feasible. Um, it'll be so, so loud, so loud. Um, when are they launching? They are launching in about 15 and a half minutes or something. They're launching at like 53 or something or 52. Yeah. It'll be pretty sweet. Boca Chica. I, I can see uh, Texas Brownsville. Yeah, people test fire into the water. The, uh, <laughs> oh, I can't keep up with you guys. I'm very excited to be back too. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, Matthew. Hi, Tim. Can you? Ex Thank you, Matthew. Uh, can you explain briefly how the fairing recover operation works? Will you be doing a longer video on it? Yes, I will be doing a long video all about the fairing recovery once we know enough about it. And I kind of was waiting until they actually do it. So maybe I'll pre-script it so that, you know, as soon as it actually happens, kind of like I did with Static Fire Falcon Heavy, I can have something out right away. But basically, the fairings, unlike the center core uh, or the, the first stage of the, of the boosters, um, it's they're very lightweight large surface area so there's not um so it can re-enter without needing to do like you know retro propulsion through the uh re-entry phase they're light enough weight that it, it doesn't have enough mass behind it. so look at you know if you look at a fairing it's kind of like a nice cup compared to you know the first stage when it falls back down it's super streamlined like an arrow and it has a lot of mass with all those engines and additional fuel and very like aerodynamic you know it's skinny there's not a lot of surface area so when that thing comes back into the atmosphere it screams into the atmosphere and the atmosphere can actually tear up the first stage. That's why the first stage has to do that re-entry burn. Fairings, on the other hand, are a big enough surface area. They're light enough weight that they can just kind of gently hit the atmosphere. They do have some, some RCS thrusters, some reaction control systems that help orient the fairings so they stay uh, rounded side down during re-entry. Once they re-enter, eventually they do pull a, uh, a paragliding parachute or like a, a steerable parachute. Um, that's where they're having problems right now is keeping that parachute steering um, because uh, the you know there's a huge aerodynamic surface below them. Don't forget these fairings are so hard to picture how big they are. It is insane. Uh, I actually just walked alongside a bunch of them at SpaceX like two weeks ago, and they are unbelievably huge uh you can basically fit a you know a school bus inside them that's kind of the, the common reference you don't realize how big they are until you're walking and it takes you like 12 seconds to walk past one you know they're huge and they're mostly carbon fiber they're crazy expensive um but that being said they obviously have a lot of drag themselves so having a parachute follow that uh, is is apparently becoming quite the challenge so i'm sure they're working on it um yeah it'll be It'll be really cool. If they can recover that, that'll be awesome. Um, yes, the launch. Okay, so Christopher, uh, and, and thank you again, Matthew. Uh, Christopher Alde has a, a great question. Read the launch window was only 31 seconds. That's correct. But don't forget, SpaceX actually with their um, full thrust with, this, with these types of rockets, they don't have any more than about one second no matter what. So no matter what the actual launch window is, they only have about one second, and that's because SpaceX uses um, super chilled propellant and oxidizer. And they get it down to the point where it's just about to turn into a solid, uh, both their oxygen and their liquid fuel. They chill them both literally as much as you can to pack as much performance as possible. So as soon as that stuff's loaded, they basically have to go right away within seconds, literally. Um, and 
the longer the rocket sits there venting and heating up uh, it loses performance and since the vehicle is optimized for that really really cold fuel and oxidizer um, every second that they sit there they they, they can't actually they just can't sit there with the, with this iteration of falcon 9 since they've been doing the super chilled with version 1.2 um yeah so so this full thrust variant is is incapable really of anything longer than an instantaneous launch window but um here we go they're ready i'm ready okay so remember guys when this goes on i'm i'm gonna let them do the talking um i'll back down i want to hear what they have to say too and then I'll try to interject in between, so... Um, yeah, that's kind of why instantaneous, yet 31 seconds. We can talk more about that later if you guys have more questions. Let me know. Why is NASA not using a Rocket Labs rocket? Well, this has been on the books for a while. Jerome. Alright. It is April 18th, 2018, just after 6.37 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and you are looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket with NASA's test spacecraft on top, awaiting its 6.51 p.m. local time launch. Good afternoon from SpaceX headquarters here in Hawthorne, California. My name is Lauren Lyons, and I'm engineer in our flight reliability department, and I'll be your host for today's webcast. Today we are launching NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS for short, after Falcon 9 drops it off in a high Earth orbit, it'll be on its way to go hunt for potentially habitable planets outside of our solar system. And SpaceX is super excited to be playing a role in such a cool mission today. Throughout the webcast, we're going to tell you more about TESS, how Falcon 9 will get it to orbit, and bring you video of our attempt to land the first stage on the East Coast drone ship, Of Course, I Still Love You. Now today we're launching out of Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, which is one of SpaceX's two East Coast launch sites. On the pad, you can see here that two-stage Falcon 9 vehicle, which stands 70 meters tall, and that's taller than a 20-story building. The first stage, which is the bottom two-thirds of the rocket, is our booster stage. And that, along with the nine Merlin engines, is what does the bulk of the work to get Falcon 9 from the ground and up into the thinner parts of the Earth's atmosphere to the edge of space. And we're going to attempt to land this stage today on the drone ship after it separates from the upper stage. Now that upper stage, or stage two as we call it, that's right on top of stage one and has a single MVAC engine on it. That's Merlin vacuum engine. That's the engine that ignites after stage one separates and begins its journey back to Earth. The second stage is what's going to carry tests from the edge of space and accelerate it to orbital speeds of just over seven and a half kilometers per second. Now TESS is currently sitting on the very top of that stack inside of our 17 foot diameter payload fairing. That's that nose cone structure you see on your screen up top. The fairing is what protects the spacecraft from aerothermal heating and loads as we launch it into space. Once we reach vacuum, we're gonna separate the two halves of that nose cone of that fairing and have them come back to Earth because we don't need them anymore. Now the trust structure that you see on your screen there, that is referred to as our transporter erector. This is what we use not only to roll the rocket out of the hangar and to the pad and then to lift it up and support it in its vertical position, but is also what routes Falcon 9's fluids, power, and telemetry umbilicals from the ground systems all the way to the vehicle itself and does so until Falcon 9 goes on internal power and launches and clears the pad. At that point, the vehicle's internal flight computer and automation and radio frequency communication is what's going to take over. Now, following successful deployment of the test spacecraft, this is going to be the 52nd Falcon 9 launch, the 24th Falcon 9 landing, if we're successful today, and SpaceX's eighth launch this year. Sweet. Uh, if someone asked what are the, the radio, the towers next to the Falcon 9, those are lightning towers. Um, they're to make sure that if they're the highest, most electrical, thing if there is lightning florida is actually one of the lightning capitals of the united states and uh yeah operators you want began loading propellants on the falcon 9 at t minus 70 minutes and falcon 9 is powered by by propellant engines that is they consume a fuel which is rp1 and an oxidizer which is liquid oxygen fuel is about 90 percent or so loaded on the rocket and stage uh sorry on stage one and 75 percent loaded on stage two Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, RP-1, the fuel, is fully loaded on stage one and two. And it's LOX that's about 90% loaded on stage one and 75% loaded on stage two. 
Now, liquid oxygen is that super chilled uh, oxidizer that we use inside of our ox tank. And coming up next, what we're going to hear on the call out is engine chill. This is where we flow a small amount of that liquid oxygen through to the engines in order to cool them down to their operating temperature. So that when we start feeding them their full flow of liquid oxygen in flight, that lock stays nice and cold and doesn't heat up and start to boil off and cause bubbles and other performance issues on the engines. Listening in on the weather nets, it's sounding like we are looking good for an on-time launch today. I'm not hearing about any issues with upper level clouds. Our ground level winds are looking within limits, as are those upper level winds, and we're within our lightning rules. Spacecraft is currently healthy, it's on internal power, and the range is currently go for an on-time launch today. Sweet. So yeah, those lightning rods, they're to make sure that if there's lightning in the area, they go for those giant towers and not the rocket. That would be bad. Um, thank you, Paul Jr. in, dis in our chat for, uh, yeah, 10,000 new subs in the last month without a new video. That's very encouraging. Apparently, you guys are still finding me okay, uh, even though I've been absent. Remember, you'll be, I, I think you'll so be excited. today's mission is really, really cool. We are launching NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. This is a mission that's operated by MIT, managed by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and it's the second launch that SpaceX has conducted for NASA's Launch Services Program. And at just 365 kilograms and just under five feet tall, TESS may be small, but it is doing big things. This Planet Hunter is an orbital observatory that will discover thousands of planets by monitoring over 200,000 stars in nearby planet systems, or star systems. Its science instrument is comprised of four high-tech, wide field of view cameras designed and manufactured by MIT's Lincoln Laboratory. These cameras will allow tests to detect exoplanets, which are planets that are outside of our solar system. It does this by looking for a phenomenon known as a transit. This is where a planet passes in front of its host star, causing a periodic dip in that star's brightness. This allows scientists to assess the size, mass, atmospheric composition, and structure of those planets. And this is particularly exciting to astrophysicists and astrobiologists because some of those planets may fall into what is referred to as the habitable zone. That means it might have the right conditions to sustain liquid water and potentially support life. Falcon 9 will be ingesting tests, injecting tests into a, an elliptical high Earth orbit that at its highest point reaches 273,000 kilometers. That's over two thirds of the way to our moon. After test separates from Falcon 9 over the next 60 days, the spacecraft will use its onboard thrusters to perform a series of maneuvers, which includes a flyby of the moon in order to slingshot it into its final high Earth science orbit. This orbit is what's gonna give TESS an unobstructed view of the night sky, allowing the spacecraft to absorb and observe and catalog thousands of exoplanets for future studies by the James Webb Space Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, and large ground-based observatories. Sweet. I'm really excited for this mission. This is gonna be a cool one. Uh, obviously, exoplanets are really exciting. And if you don't know what an exoplanet is, just basically a planet outside of our solar system. Um, Internal sequences have started. So yeah, oh, first off, Osley, thank you. No launch would be complete without commentary from Everyday Astronaut. Well, thank you. I'm sorry that I was gone for two of them. Uh, that being said, I did see one of them. And you guys are gonna see a lot more about that. All right, we are about four minutes and 45 seconds away from liftoff. So let's check in on the rocket one more time before stepping into the terminal count. Fuel is fully loaded on both stages and liquid oxygen is being topped off right now as we speak. The rocket is also now pressurizing itself with helium gas. We we'll use that gas in order to maintain the structural strength of the rocket while on the ground and in flight. And very soon what you're gonna see is those cradle arms that are holding the rocket, they're going to open up and the transporter erector is going to lean back slightly. It's going to retract. You also might see some venting coming from the side of the TV, from the TE, that's totally normal. It's just liquid oxygen that's boiling off, heating up and being released from the tanks. At T minus one minute, the rocket's internal flight computers are gonna take over, which you're here on the countdown net as Falcon 9 is in startup. The range is currently looking good for an on-time launch today. The payload is healthy on internal power and is go, and weather is go. We are looking awesome for a 6.51 p.m. T zero. First off, thank you, Max. That's very generous. Now our 
Except launch window here. today is only 30 seconds long, but that's pretty much an instantaneous window. If for some reason we can't get off today, we'll come back again tomorrow at 7.09 p.m. Eastern time to give it another go. So with that, let's listen in to the last three and a half minutes of terminal count. Sweet. Is that retract angle, 88.3 degrees? Um, yeah, Sean, Sean Devine asked if there's ever been a lightning strike in a rocket. There has, I believe it was Apollo 12. Uh, actually got hit during ascent, which is crazy. Was that what it was, Apollo 12 or 14? I think it was, yeah. Um, got hit during ascent, and that actually helped change the rules. There's a cumulus cloud we'll rule now that all rocket launches have to obey. Stage Apollo 12, complete. thank you guys. Um, also, people are noting that my launch, or my stream is about 10 seconds behind. It's because I have to ingest it first and then rebroadcast it. So it goes through. If that was 10 seconds or extra important to you, I understand, but... Uh, yeah, I can't really change physics, unfortunately. Someone else asked what's the difference between a suicide burn and a hover slam. Really nothing other than no man. Like, it's not very PC or not a very good idea to put something, put someone on something and call it a suicide burn eventually. Um, but they're basically the same thing. Some people pedantically have made up this uh, argument that perhaps a hover slam means that you can't that your thrust to weight ratio is above 1.0, 1, 1. like the Falcon 9. That means, um, say it were to miss, so as it, as it starts its suicide burn or its hover slam, if it were to stop too early, it would actually start going back up because it can't throttle down anymore. Um, and some people have kind of said that maybe that's what a hover slam is, is a, is a suicide burn Stage where your two, complete. thrust to weight ratio is, um, is above 1.0. But that's just internet talk. Um, yeah, I, I thanked I thanked Max for his generous donation. It was awesome. Um, grid fins, yes, are titanium, and well, currently these ones are aluminum. These are block four ish or whatever pre block five vehicles uh, and stuff like grid fins. So they are painted aluminum. Ground gas closeouts um, is starting. Block five will be using those beautiful titanium ones, which are about ten percent larger. Um, they are cast. Is that what it is? I always forget if it's cast or forged. Um, yeah, why are they landing this? Because they can still get one good additional use out of these, uh, this architecture, out of these pre-block fives, without ATS much ready for launch. refurbishment. Titanium grid fins are unpainted. That is correct. Cast, okay, thank you I said that wrong in the video. Ground gas close as it's complete. They are cast. Stage two, pressing for flight. Thanks, Chris Harris. Hi. LD, go for launch. I can't wait. Um, Falcon Heavy won't be in June, but I'll hopefully be at the next Falcon Heavy. All right, let's do this. Uh, no, these are again aluminum grid fins. You can tell because they're white. Otherwise, they're really dark when they're Stage one is at startup pressures. T minus 15 seconds. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7. Water deluge happening. 5. Look for the green four, flash. 3, 2, yes, 1. Mission. Lift off. Nine Berlin engines producing 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Zero boost launch flight operations. Do it, baby. Shaking the buildings two miles away. I love it. Thanks again for Chris Harris. Falcon 9 goes Hess from NASA. Thanks, Elon. Yes. Lift up. Beautiful launch already. Look at that sky, crystal clear. As you just saw, Falcon 9 has successfully cleared the pad and is now on its ascent with the test spacecraft in its fairing. Now coming up in about 15 minutes, you're going to hear the call out that Falcon 9 will have hit max Q. That stands for maximum aerodynamic pressure. That is the point at which the rocket is seeing its highest stresses on its ascent. That's a great shot. Look how clear it is today, guys. Vehicle has passed maximum aerodynamic pressure. 
You can tell by the cheers and what you heard on that call out. We have gotten through Max Q. Coming up next, you're going to hear uh, the call for in back engine chilling. back engine chill has begun. And that was it. Notice that, that is where we exhaust. chill in that Merlin vacuum engine down to operating temperature. Notice the exhaust starts to look wider and wider. It, it is actually expanding more and more because the atmosphere is getting thinner and thinner. And that hot now coming and up expansive here shortly, gas hear three big events happening wider. in rapid succession. The first is MECO. That stands for main engine cutoff. That is where all nine of the first stage engines are going to shut down. That's in preparation for the next step, which is stage sep or stage separation. There's where stage one will separate from stage two. Stage one will make its way back down to the drone ship. Stage two will continue on with tests to its orbit. And then you're going to hear second engine start. That is the ignition of the second stage engine. Let's check it out here. All right, here we go. It's probably going to be a pretty early cutoff because this is a pretty easy flight profile. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Ignition. Stage one is out of the trip. Contact ignition. Stage one flipped right. real quick. And as you just saw, we had a really successful quick. stage separation and a successful ignition of that second stage engine. So on the left side, you're looking down the fuselage of the first stage. Yeah. Now the fairing should be deploying at any right moment. Here. There we go. Fairing just deployed. And you can see that tiny but strong test spacecraft inside of that or on top of stage two. Sweet. Now stage one is making its way back down to Earth. What we're going to see coming up pretty shortly is a boost back burn. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Grid fins deployed. Grid they fins have deployed. Already did the boost back burn, didn't they? Both stages following nominal trajectories. I'm glad to be back, Johnny. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. Right now, stage two is going to continue to burn until T plus eight minutes and 20 seconds, while stage one makes its way back down to Earth. Now, th there are two more burns coming up for stage one. Um, the, the next one's going to be the entry burn. That's where we're going to reignite three of the stage one engines. And that burn is intended to slow down stage one's descent as it makes its way through that thick upper atmosphere. We'll be seeing that at six minutes and 29 seconds or so, so in about two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Um, no, I didn't break it. It's just hard to get it back onto the little transport erector. Um, I just took it out of it, and then I had to fumble around for way too long. Oh, man. What a gorgeous launch. Okay, so you can see the first stage is now falling back down. Um, unfortunately, we're following the second stage's telemetry here. So the telemetry on the right is still looking at the increase, basically, in velocity. Notice the second stage won't be going that much higher. We're hearing um, that stage but two's it's, burn is still performing nominally. But its velocity increases a lot. And that's basically the point of the upper stage. Is it's already in space. Uh, space starts at 100 kilometers in altitude, um, 62 miles. So it's well above that. And it's really mostly horizontal right now. Um, and it's gaining velocity. That's how you stay in okay, orbit. Stage two's going to continue to burn for velocities. about another three minutes. And one minute until we see that reentry burn. Um, they, now, after that reentry burn, they are not uh, Stage One is going to continue on making its way down to the drone ship, and coming up thereafter will be the landing burn. That'll be the third of the three burns, and at that point, we're going to reignite that center engine E9, and that'll bring us down to zero velocity. Hopefully, standing up tall on the drone ship. Continuing to hear that impact D is looking good. Turbo pump performance is good. Everything is performing nominally on stage two, which is great news. Um, Thomas, yes, I do hope to go to IAC, and thank you for your tip. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to. I'm planning to if I can. I'm going to try to keep it open. I love Germany. I love IAC, so I hope to go, yeah. 
And Ryan, thank you. Welcome back. Uh, fun to watch this with you and everyone. Well, I'm really happy to be back. Um, and, it, yeah, it, I've... It, it was a long month. Burn has begun. That entry burn. Yeah, it's been a long month. Yeah, burn it's looking good. It's going to go for about another 10 seconds or so before it shuts down. So they're basically just slowing the vehicle down so that the atmosphere doesn't rip it apart. And the entry burn is complete. So All right, now time for the grid fins to start getting spicy. They might start glowing. Hey, also, this might continues to burn. Go into darkness too. Getting Remember, it's a couple hundred. Into a nice circular yeah. orbit. Yeah. Where a test will then, well, stage two with tests on top will coast for about 35 minutes. As you heard, stage one is transonic. We're about 10 seconds away from that landing landing burn. Note that the drone ship is situated approximately 300 kilometers off the coast of Florida. And as you can see, that landing burn started. There you go. Let's see if we can catch it. it. Might be close enough to shore to be able to not cut our feed. But don't forget, this has to be a satellite uplink when it's this far. There it is. Look at that. This is a great feed they've got. Wow. Oh, that's cool. Sweet. And as you can hear from the applause and the video right there on your screen, the first stage has successfully landed on a fourth I Still Love You. This marks the 24th successful landing of a Falcon 9 first stage. No real cutout there on the And booster. meanwhile, That's we've reached awesome. Seco, which is second engine cutoff. Stage two has shut down its first burn. Now That's stage beautiful. two should be in a parking orbit of about 250 by 250 kilometers. That was good. Stage two is now going to coast for 35 minutes or so. So why don't you come back here at T plus 39 minutes, where we're going to bring you back to the webcast, where we're going to resume it, and we will be relighting the second stage engine for a second time in order to raise the apogee of our orbit to 273,000 kilometers. That gets us into Tesla's highly elliptical orbit, where we will then deploy the spacecraft. So. We're going to continue showing you some live views of space and of tests and of stage two. And we'll be back to commentate the webcast in T plus, at T plus 42 minutes. Sweet. All right, I'm just going to do this for a little bit here then. This is why we, uh, this is why we do this together, guys, so that we still have stuff to talk about uh, during that 30 plus minute coast phase. So uh, yeah, we have a lot of, uh, let, me know, let me know if you guys have questions. Um, yeah, this is a this is a great one. Um, also, welcome to those of you. I, I feel like there might be some new Discord members, um, our Patreons and our Discord channel. Um, if you want to become a, a Discord member and help us script and research, these people help me give feedback and double check my work as I get ready for videos. And they also have their own. Obviously, we have a streaming service. It's limited only to disc or Patreon members. If you want to contribute in that sense, go to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. Um, huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys know how crazy this past month has been and how absolutely insane it's been and how I couldn't be doing what I do without you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are the best, really. Um, yeah, so if you want to if you want to join, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. And also, um, let's see, um, on Unworn Tripod. I like that name. Uh, love the videos. Do we know if they are planning on landing at the launch pad for CRS 15 in June? I am planning a trip and would love to see it land. That's a great question. I don't know yet. I, gosh, I feel like I knew something about CRS 15. Um, it might, I think it's slated to be on block five. And if it is, then yes, it will be landing, and it will be an RTLS. Um, CRS missions are pretty easy to do, return to launch sites. Um, does, if anyone knows differently, though, let me know. Um, yeah, 
let, let me know, I, but I don't think so. Also, um, Max, thank you again for your donation. Thank you so much. Uh, your 10-year-old, uh, your girl, Andrea, hi. SpaceX super fan. She's a fan of my transmission. Can I say hello to her? Hello, Andrea. Thank you for watching along, and I, I'm glad you're excited about SpaceX, and hopefully we can stick around and you can learn more about all types of rockets and all types of space flight, and just stay excited. Keep learning, and you'll do great. Uh, Josh, have I toured SpaceX facility, and if not, you have a friend who may... I just toured... Thank you, Josh, first off. I just toured last... No, two weeks ago. Um, I also spoke at SpaceX last year, uh, like a year ago, February. Um, I love, yeah, visiting SpaceX is awesome. I've got uh, a couple, several really good friends that work at SpaceX. Um, yeah, and I just love going there. How could you not? Um, so thank you. Thank you for that, Josh. And Broken Life Cycle. How would the BFR booster land? Um, it'll be doing a similar thing to the Falcon 9. Um, the booster portion... The biggest difference is it doesn't have landing legs. It's hopefully going to be landing back on the launch cradle itself. So they expect to be able to really, really, really nail that. Um, high precision. So this will be crazy. Watching the BFR land will probably make me absolutely cry because it's going to be absolutely massive. And if it really lands where it took off, yeah, that'll be nuts. But that's the plan. It does, it does all the same maneuvers, basically, though, as the Falcon 9 first stage. Um, so especially uh, if it's landing back on the launch pad, that means it will have to do that boost back burn so it puts its velocity back towards the launch pad because normally rockets curve out and they gain velocity to get into orbital speeds. Um, so the BFR booster will have to tip around, do that boost back burn, do a reentry burn, and then do a landing burn. It'll be very similar to the Falcon 9. Um, yeah, but it, like I said, it hopefully is going to be landing on the launch pad. And look at how close. So people ask sometimes, why doesn't the first stage look at, uh, maybe you can't see that very well, let me make this big again. Um, look at how, cl how close and in, in relative distance, how close the drone ship was. It's only, you know, 300 kilometers down range. And then that's how, it's only going about one fourth the speed that it needs to get into, into orbital velocity. And that's why the second stage burns for another, you know, six to whatever minutes, however long it may be. And that gets it up into that orbital velocity, and that means it's going fast enough to never... So imagine throwing a ball, or you know, shooting a gun, and it eventually it curves and arcs down. Uh, gravity pulls it back down. Well, if you go fast enough, or throw something far enough, and you're outside of the atmosphere where the atmosphere slows you down, if you're going fast enough, you just keep falling, basically. You're going so fast, and you're falling at the exact same rate, and that's what orbit is. So that's why the second stage is able to keep going. The first stage is right there. And even if it burnt out the rest of its fuel, it only ends up a little bit further away. So, yeah. Um, also, hi from Mberka. Hi. Thank you so much for your your uh, your tip. Thank you. And hello. Pray. You saw from your house decent visibility, but still, that's awesome. I'm really jealous. Thank you for your, for your tip. And Chris Harris, you're actually an author and one of your... Uh, main characters in your current book is named is Tessa. Bizarre world that they would name their sat after a character in your book. I th I'm pretty sure they read your mind and then inserted, uh, made Tess because of it. So thank you. Thank you, Chris, for naming your character that. Um, okay, interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. That was a pretty great launch. Um, Matt, thank you again for your donation. Uh, you would love to hear my take on the on party balloon. We talked about that briefly at the top of the um, at the top of the broadcast. I'll, I'll talk about it again though. Um, the entry balloon thing is crazy, of course, but it's not absurd. Um, NASA has, you know, about three years ago, I think, we're dealing with, or maybe two years ago, had tested out their supersonic um, what uh, inflatable heat shield, basically, and it's just like in Kerbal Space Program. There's that like inflatable pancake thing. Uh, and what it does is it's, it's a low density, increases the surface area a lot. I, and what it does then is it allows that upper atmosphere to really start slowing the vehicle down. Um, it's a cool concept, and I, I am glad they're going to be trying to play around with it. Um, I think it's not going to be available for all missions, because it will add additional mass. Um, yeah, it's going to be really cool, though. That's I'm really excited about them maybe trying to use a 
giant party to blo party balloon to recover the second stage. Um, and people will then be like, well, why didn't they just do that with the first stage? Well, the first stage is a lot bigger, a lot taller, um, has a lot more mass. Um, it The scale of economics just it doesn't scale up. And it's so tall and skinny. Landing on parachutes and trying to use some kind of parafoil, it just the scale of it gets so much bigger. If you think about how big the first stage is, compared to the little tiny upper stage, um, the upper stage is a lot more manageable. Um, but it is still kind of will be interesting to see if they do use like a pair of parafoil to actually finally land that. Um, oh, also, thank you, uh, Dahaka. Thank you, first time watching my live stream. Uh, it's great, so many additional information. Well, thank you. Join again, make sure and subscribe. I do a lot of, um, if in case you guys happen to have stumbled upon here, these are just kind of for fun. My main thing is making these scripted videos where I take a topic and really try to drill it in. And speaking of guys, oh, I keep forgetting tonight, uh, after this, so it's like six o'clock my time. I'm in central time zone in the United States um, In about two and a half hours. So 845, which is like, oh, like three or something UTC Maybe like 245 UTC something like that. Um, I will be doing today-ish in space flight history with my friend Jacob He's a guy that knows nothing about space nothing about space flight and I teach him I recreate historical missions today's historical mission is one of my all-time favorite missions It's gonna be awesome um, we're gonna recreate it. He's gonna ask a bunch of questions and we're gonna learn together um, That'll be tonight. It'll be up online tomorrow to watch if you miss the broadcast So be sure and check those out. I know some people are like, oh, you need to stop playing Kerbal and blah 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 I promise these are fun. Check it out. Give it, uh, an, you know, and keep an open mind I think they're a lot of fun. Jacob's hilarious and he knows so little about space. It's almost shocking But we still love him nonetheless. So Yeah um, Let's see here. <laughs> First, okay, so Mark, thank and thank you for your tip, by the way, Doc da, Dahaka. Uh, Mark's Nico, stop playing on your phone and watch this vid. <laughs> Nico, stop playing on your phone and watch this video. You might learn something and become a rocket scientist. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Max Maxi Boy, why next orbit appears to be on a different plane? Well. That's a great question. Um, it's mostly because the we're looking at the Earth relative. So the Earth is still spinning um, below the orbit. So the orbit's actually staying the same, but the Earth is spinning. And it, it's really hard to, uh, uh, it hurts my head just thinking about it. But basically, the orbit's staying the same, but we're looking at the Earth relative to the Earth. I don't know, I don't, is that right guys? Um, or is it because, no, because they don't take into account yet the, the next burn, which will be way off this, so I'm not entirely sure. Uh, maybe someone will know. Um, <laughs> Philip, I'm sorry. I don't mean to give you insomnia. <laughs> um, yeah, let me know if something's wrong with the, the uh, my understanding of why the orbit looks off. And uh, Jake, thank you. Uh, that first stage landing feed was on point. Love what you do and enjoy supporting you on Patreon. Keep, ins uh, keep inspiring. Thank you so much, Jake. Thank you for being a, a Patreon member and thanks for your tip. That really means a lot. I, I Again, I can't do this stuff without you guys. So um, your feedback, the growth of the community has been absolutely overwhelming and is the reason that I continue to do this. Um, had it not gone this well and you had you not all been so responsive and supportive, I'd be back to doing full-time photography and not making time for this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Jason, thank you for your tip. Um, ben C, do I think NASA's SLS is already rendered obsolete, uh, viably and economically by BFR? Um, ben, that's a great question. That's actually one of the scripts that I'm working on right now is kind of NASA versus SpaceX. It's one of those questions we get often. Um, and I, I don't think it's fair to compare the two entities because one is a private company one is a government um, agency so it's not really fair to compare them head to head and you know how collaborative they really are how much NASA has invested in SpaceX to make them who they are but it is fair to compare rockets to rockets and that's what we're going to be doing in my next video um, I think my next video unless there's one that might bump in front of it real quick but that's the one that I'm scripting right now um, SLS versus BFR will be on there so yeah um, I, I think it's, uh, I, 
I'm not, I, I don't hate uh, SLS. I think had it gone online about 10 years ago, it would have been incredible. Um, I think it's been slow and frustrating to watch how long it's taken to get online. But, um, yeah, I don't hate SLS, though. Um, I really want to see it fly. We're this close to seeing it fly. I know sunk cost fallacy. I know I'm as bad as everyone that's like, well, we already are like 90% of the way there. We might as well spend the extra $1.7 billion or whatever it takes to get it off the ground. I fall into that camp because, darn it, I just want to see a big, huge rocket fly ASAP. So, yeah, um, that's my thoughts. Mark, thank you very much for your tip. Um, that was a great launch. You are absolutely right. And Moonix, um, I'm gonna shave if the test if they test fly the BFR prototype next year. Sure, if you if that's what you guys need me to do, if you think I need to shave when they fly, sure. I mean, I'll do that. I'll do whatever. I'm not that attached to this thing, but I will. I can do it for you. Um, fair and recovery this time. They were not, and thank you by the way, Munix. Um, fair and recovery this time. I don't. They were not recovering the fairing, but they still tested. I believe they did not have Mr. Steve in the recovery ship out there to recover the fairings. But hopefully, they're still gathering data and getting ready to actually catch it. Uh, music's loud, huh? I'll turn it down. Thank you, Fell. Hey, sorry guys. Uh. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't know if it was loud or not. Okay, I, I've got it down now. Hopefully that's better. Um, yes, uh, let me just finish. Orbit is relative to Earth's center of mass, not the spin of the Earth. There we go. Thank you very much, uh, DRKJK. Thank you. Um, so, I... Center of mass, not the spin of the Earth. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, Philip James, did I see the new Omega rocket from ATK? Seems so curable to have solid rocket first stage. Uh, Philip, yes, I did see that. And, um, yeah, so Orbital ATK, I think Monday announced their new Omega rocket. And this is, in typical or Orbital ATK fashion, it's using solids. Uh, Orbital ATK is, uh, Orbital ATK, a division of Northrop Grumman, is infamous for building uh, solid rocket boosters. They did the big solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle, wherever my space shuttle model is. You know, the big white solid rocket boosters on the side of the orange external fuel tank. Those were made by um, ATK, now Orbital ATK, now North of Grumman Division, or Orbital ATK, a, a subdivision of North of Grumman, or whatever it is. Um, they're really good at making solids. That's kind of their thing. Um, and this is basically... A bunch of, I believe, are the, the caster engines, caster 600, caster 300, and then some strap-ons. Um, they're big old solid rocket, solid rocket boosters, and uh, and then on top is a dual RL10 Centaur upper stage. Basically, I don't know if it's called Centaur because Centaur would probably be what ULA named it, um, but a dual RL10 liquid fuel upper stage, which is hilarious because this is basically the opposite of their Antares rocket. Their Antares rocket is what um, does their resupply missions to the International Space Station. So don't forget there's CRS missions for SpaceX and their Dragon capsule, but also Orbital ATK has their um, Cygnus capsule riding on top of an Antares rocket. It doesn't fly very often, um, and it went boom boom once, uh, only about five or six seconds into launch. Um, that uses RD-180, um, the same engine as an Atlas V, and a liquid first stage, and then it has kind of two more solids. So the Omega is basically the opposite of that, and I think that's hilarious. Um, and it also, not only that, the, the Omega also has strap-on solid rocket boosters as well, so it's solids on top of solids on top of solids. I'm excited, I don't know, it's cool. Um, yeah. Uh, Omega is a continuation of the Ares-1, the idea of using a space shuttle booster as a launch vehicle, just more refined, a lot more refined. The Ares-1 was really interesting, it launched once as a dummy at the cost of like one billion dollars, um, and yeah, it was interesting. It looks really silly. So yeah, um, also thank you, um, uh, thank you Bjorn, uh, why not land back at the Cape? When they have enough propellant where the payload were so light, love your streams. They are the media of life. Well, thank you. Um, this, so they did have to inject, it's, even though it's a teeny, 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 tiny payload, it's going beyond geostationary orbit even. It's going on a pretty high energy orbit. So um, that's why they had enough residual propellant in the first stage to do a little bit of a boost back burn, but they didn't have enough probably to try to do a full return to launch site. Um, I'm sure they just base it on like, hey, here's how much we need, this. here's how much the second stage can deliver this to. And then basically they subtract 
uh, the first stage from that. And they just say, okay, well, we're going to have this much left over in the first stage. They look at their numbers. Here's how far we can, here's the easiest profile we can land. Um, yeah, here's the best profile. And unfortunately with this, not unfortunately, just what, it's not even fortunate or unfortunate, although it is unfortunate if you're out of the cape and you don't get to see it land, because that is awesome. But really, it doesn't really matter where it lands as long as it comes home safe. So yeah, this one did not have enough margin to do a full boost back burn and cancel out the rest of the velocity. It would have had to, you know, cancel out another 300 kilometers in velocity. Um, it just didn't have the remains. That's why. Hope that hope that helps. And Bradley, thank you. I am the only person you're currently supporting on Patreon. I'm by far your favorite YouTuber. Can't wait for Secret Mission. Well, thank you very much, Bradley. That really means a lot. Again, I say this, and I'm so 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 sincere that I would not be doing this stuff without Patreon and without your guys' tips in here as well. This is what allows me to be able to do this. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I can't wait for you to see Secret Mission either. So stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed on Instagram and or Twitter, wherever. And just pay attention on, on YouTube. I'll be doing a status update on YouTube as well on the community tab when Secret Mission is released um, or announced. Awesome. Crimson Interstellar. Hi, Tim. Tim, greetings from, greetings from Northwest Iowa. Hi, you're a huge fan. How's the snow in Cedar Falls? Well, first off, thank you. Um, the snow in Cedar Falls right now. Not as bad as they were thinking. They were supposed to have like five inches in April, which is cabbage. Not excited about that. I'm really excited by the weekend. It's going to be like 60 degrees, which sounds quite pleasant to me. Um, I don't know, what is that, like 18C or something, or 17, I don't know, warmer than right now. It's like zero degrees uh, Celsius, so yeah, it's going to warm quite a bit by the weekend. I'm really excited for that. So thank you, Crimson, and hello, fellow Iowan. Thanks for saying hi. And Blair, thank you. From your understanding of the mission, won't the second stage have a very high apoapsis, making re-entry speeds at periapsis an odd time to try to recover a second stage? They are not trying, they will not be recovering this second stage at all. Um, Elon hasn't mentioned when they're going to be trying to, first off, thanks Blair, thank you. Um, e Elon didn't say when they're going to be recovering the second stage, and it's definitely not on this mission because they're actually going to be expending this mission into um, a solar orbit. So it's going to do a final burn uh, after a while and then just put itself out into a junkyard orbit um, around the sun. So it is not... Uh, you are right, though, if, if they were trying to do that balloon re-entry, this would have a lot faster. So in order to get up to, uh, and I'm speaking to everyone here, in order to get up to a, a really high orbit, in order to raise your orbit, you basically end up speeding up at your lowest point. So say you're kind of like this and you go up pretty high. Uh, and if in order to make this go higher and higher and higher, you have to speed up down here. And that means that after you do that, when you come back down, if you're going to re-enter, you're going to be going really extra fast. Uh, when you get to that lowest point. So obviously extra speed during re-entry is very, very, very hard to deal with. So yeah, um, this would be a particularly extra challenging mission to uh, return from. So would geostationary orbit, um, low earth orbit would be the easiest for the second stage to recover from. So we'll see, good question. Um, Mark, hi, Mark, thank you for your donation. In Barcelona, we don't have much rocketry, but we do know a thing or two about food. I'm invited to, if I ever come. Well, thank you, Mark. I have never actually been to Barcelona. Um, but thank you very much. And, and uh, yeah, that sounds amazing. You do know a thing or two about food. You also have, uh, don't forget, you do have Zero to Infinity, which is a Spanish company. And they're doing some really cool things. Their Blue Star concept is awesome. Look into it. It's very cool. I believe they're actually based in Barcelona. Alex, thank you. Welcome back. Glad Tess went well. Always better launches with her stream. Well, thank you. That means a lot <laughs> for a few for a few pops and broke. Well, thank you, Alex. Thank you, guys. Um, boo for snow. That's right. Uh, they used the Falcon 9 just because of the high energy orbit. Um, Shaggy. Basically, yes. If that's what you're asking, um, they use they yeah they use the Falcon 9 because of a higher energy orbit. Although a much smaller launch vehicle still could have done this orbit. This is such a small payload. Um, a lot less capable vehicle could have probably done this mission as well. Um, it is a very inexpensive rocket. Um, wow, thank you. Uh, wow, hey, Ho Hoa Benno Schreiner Jr. Uh, sorry, I totally slaughtered that, I'm sure. Uh, you're welcome for t attempting to do metric temperatures. That's, I'm okay with, with, um, 
with size and with weight, but temperature, I'm like all just all bets off. I think I was close-ish for for uh, for Celsius, but. Yeah, I can do I can do the other ones pretty well, but not that one. So you're welcome for attempting to. I'm sorry if I was way off. Um, it is kind of a sweet spot. Yeah. Why are SpaceX committed to only using Block Five boosters for Falcon Heavy? Surely they have enough Block Fours to build another Falcon Heavy without having to wait. So the thing is, um, that's a great question, Grim, in our Discord. Um, really, I think the biggest thing is here is that it does take refurbishment and. Think about how much, especially to make a side core booster or a Falcon 9 booster into those side core boosters, still takes quite a bit of work. And if they, you know, if they're looking to Falcon Heavy truly being fully reusable over and over and over again, um, if they spend the time and energy to, to refurbish and turn a Block 4 Falcon Heavy over again, then they just kind of are wasting it because it'll probably not launch again in that configuration. So. They are looking just to the next thing. Make it all block five, make it rapidly reusable and lower refurbishment. So um, I'm, I'm sure they have their reasons. I, I think the truth of the matter is it's probably quite expensive and, and difficult to refurbish the current versions, which is why we've only seen them flying once. Um, and that's why they're pursuing block five so heavily. They know and they hope that that's going to be fully worth it. So yeah. Um, <laughs> Philip, I agree. Uh, zero freezing point of water, 100 boiling point of water. It, no, it totally makes sense. Don't get me wrong. I 100% think Celsius is... Everything metric is a billion times better than Imperial. Don't get me wrong. I just have a hard time, you know, growing up, knowing what feels comfortable, what, you know, outside temperature is nice. I just don't quite have that scale in my head yet in Celsius, but someday. Um, people are asking about my globes. Uh, those are MOVA globes. Uh, you can find them at MOVA International. Um, yeah. MovaInternational.com, and you'll find Mova Globes. They are awesome. Uh, Joseph, you sent me a message asking about the globes. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. What? Can you, how can you get them? Thank you, Joseph. MovaInternational.com. Um, Mova Globes. M-O-V-A. They are really cool. They. Um, I think I might be getting another bigger Earth here someday. But they are powered by solar, so they actually just spin based on. Uh, there's little solar panels in there. And a little like motor and a magnet or something and they just spin which is pretty fantastic i'm a big fan of those um yeah what space nerds collection wouldn't be complete without those um oh yeah we better do i just saw someone say tomorrow's neat tmro i better mention tomorrow uh every saturday at i don't know 18 utc so you do the math there guys um is uh, one of my, uh, I'm not one of my favorite, my favorite online space show is Tomorrow, TMRO. Wonderful community, wonderful people. They do a great job of hitting a weekly space news segment that's really well produced. They need, honestly, they should be having 75,000 million subscribers at this point. They do such a good job. A lot of hard work goes into that show. I, I occasionally contribute to that show as well. I love those people. So if you aren't following tomorrow, T-M-R-O, T-M-R-O on YouTube, you're just, just wrong. You're just wrong. Um, and awesome, Jalen Watkins, thank you so much for your tip. Thank you. That means a lot. Hello. Um, yeah. Uh, by the way, guys, stay tuned. I will be having um, a lot of new videos coming out. I am back home and like ready to just be cranking out new uh, uh, lots of new videos I got a new computer so my workflow should be super crazy fast I'm really excited uh, Alyssa hi thank you why haven't SpaceX hired you for narrations and PR well SpaceX actually uses their own internal these are engineers and people that work for SpaceX are their hosts and they do it volunteer uh, they volunteer to do it um, it's a lot of extra work and a lot of extra time but they are not paid extra to do that and they are not like, ex they work for SpaceX. They work on the rockets. They are engineers and they are lead mechanics and, and flight dynamics and all these crazy cool things. They're awesome people. I'm not that. And also personally, I like not working for anyone, period. And not having to, uh, you know, I like that I can speak my mind and have a, a, an opinion about things and, and be critical. Um, if you worked for any one of the aerospace companies, you're going to have to kind of constantly be like, yeah, everything's great, even if it's not. And I prefer that. So, um, 
Uh, oh, yeah, Philip James, you're right, you are, and thank you, Alyssa. Uh, Philip James, you are indulging the camera nerd in me. I did see the Black Magic little pocket camera 4K. That's really cool. Um, is that what the Black Magic pocket cinema camera? Yeah, PCC. Yeah, that's really cool. It's really ugly. Uh, but I wish that it, I want something higher resolution than 4K. I want a 5K sensor, so I might pick up a GH5 here someday. Uh, it just makes sense in my workflow to be able to do those kind of push crops that I do in the video if I could have a higher resolution camera. I don't necessarily need 4K 60 frames per second because it doesn't matter. Um, but I would love the ability to crop in a little more. So, yeah, I probably won't be doing that. Um, uh, J Jaylene, why aren't I talking about Planet X? I don't know. Was there a new announcement about Planet, Planet X that I missed? Did something happen? Um, I don't know if there's something awesome happening with Planet X. If so, if there's something I need to be talking about with Planet X, let me know. Um, do I have any advice for driving solo from Houston to Cocoa Beach to watch Falcon Heavy? I've done that reverse thing. I've gone from Florida to, uh, to Houston, Jin Cham. And uh, I would definitely say it's worth, you can stop in Mashoud. Um, there's a NASA facility there. You could also stop in, um, What's that? The the test stand facility. What's that called in... Not Huntsville. Oh, gosh. I'm blanking. I'm blanking. Uh, Stennis. There we go. Um, yeah, I think it, it's fun to do that. You can also... I really like stopping... I think it's... Is it Tallahassee? That's really cool. One of those cities down there is pretty cool on the panhandle. Um, but other than that, just get a good, pod, a good couple podcasts. I really like... My favorite are Orbital Mechanics. Are We There Yet? Um... I like Miko, and I'm just now trying to get caught up and trying to listen to uh, We Martians as well. Um, those podcasts are amazing. Those are some good podcasts to, to listen to and, and, you know, indulge in. So, yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, there we go. You will have to drive from Los Angeles to watch the BFR. To Los An No, because the BFR will not be launching from Los Angeles. It'll just be manufactured in Los Angeles. Uh, Pensacola, that's what it is. Pensacola is really cool. Thank you, John. Yeah, I like Pensacola. Pensacola is really cool. Um, uh, landing same pad with camera here. Uh, thoughts on Blue Origin updated New Glenn? I still haven't actually seen. The only thing I've seen them talk about updating, did they announce something today? I hope that they announced something today um, at, there's the, uh, the whatchamacallit conference right now. Um, but I know that they're talking about not doing a BE-4, that's their big methane engine, um, not making that an upper stage variant and only doing BE-3 upper stage variants, um, which BE-3 runs on RP-1, or is it hydrogen? Might be hydrogen. I was thinking it was RP-1, but it might be hydrogen and oxygen as opposed to the BE-4, which is methane and oxygen, so. Acquisition of single versus. Ooh, acquisition of single. A signal. Um, Yellowstone Volcano in <laughs> Nibiru. Uh, yeah. Those are all things. I, I appreciate the tip. I'm a little confused why I'd be talking about that. Um, but yeah. Thanks, thanks Jalen. I don't... Uh, in SpaceX launches, I don't tend to talk too much about Yellowstone Volcanoes, but yeah. Um, I, by the way, when asking about Planet X, uh, I met the person that actually has... He's the one that hypothesized the existence of Planet X based on uh, slight variations in our orbits that were unexpected. His name's um, uh, Constantine, and he works for NASA, and he he definitely is on the hunt for Planet X. Um, a lot of people think we hopefully will find it in the next five years, so I'm really excited about that. Um, let's see. <laughs> Philip James, that's funny. Um Insight will be really cool. Uh, let me tell you guys, I can tell you a little secret. I may or may not have seen Insight already. So I don't have to see Insight. If you know what I mean. Michael! <laughs> if the Earth isn't flat, what is true level? Uh, it'd be absolutely perpendicular to gravity. So gravity obviously pulls everything towards its center of mass. The center of the Earth is what pulls on all of us. That is the center of mass of our planet. Um, everything is pulled down towards it. So anything perpendicular to that would be level. Um, obviously, when you know when the Earth is this as big as it is, it's really hard to picture 
um, just how big this all is until you, you know, if you were to expand this a hundred times, it would fill up, you know, it'd be bigger than my house. You might get close to seeing how small it is, but um, eventually you get to the point where there's plenty of flatness. Um, and the level has nothing to do per se with flat, but it is just perpendicular to the center of mass. Yeah, that's that's what a true level would be. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, BE3 is hydrogen and restarts. Thank you, Tim. That's that's great. Yes, hydrogen. I didn't remember if it was hydrogen or if it was uh, RP1. Um, yeah. <laughs> Kansas is true level. Michael, that's exactly right. I believe that's the right answer. Uh, Kansas. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yes, I believe so. I'm going to laugh at that in our Discord channel. Um, a small bubble in a, in, a, in a tube will tell you level. That is very true. Um, what do I think of Paul Allen's Straddle Launch? I think it's cool. Um, straddle Launch... And the second engine is about to reignite. Just heard on the nets that Impact Chillin' has begun. And pretty soon, the second stage will be reigniting to take tests to its deployment orbit. Right, in about 30 seconds, we're going to see that engine reignite. From there, the burn is going to last for about one minute before the engine shuts down again. And a few minutes after that, the test spacecraft will deploy. And they're getting ready. They are chilling them back right now. There it goes, ignition. As you just saw there, we have reignited the second stage. Okay. And this burn's gonna last for about a minute. So now you're going to see those orbits changing. This is raising the apogee of our orbit so that we can drop tests off at a place where it can then properly begin to perform its own orbit raising maneuvers to get it to that point where it can perform its lunar flyby. Um, that dust, all that dust was just, um, there's solid chunks of oxygen. There's liquid oxygen inside the propellant tanks and they vent it out and due to the the outer, we are beginning uh, the to throttle everything down, really cold. hearing that everything is looking totally normal on this on this burn, which is really good news. Um, yeah, it just kind of breaks off into chunks. It's not dust; it just has nowhere to go. And the engine so you can has see shut down. Ice again, ice chunks. And that cut off. That cut off. And now you can see it venting. Do you see that little the little vent so right there? So for about five minutes. The stage is going to coast with tests on top, at which point the payload is going to deploy. Now, the way that that works is there is what is referred to as a payload adapter that is sitting on the top of our second stage, and TESS is attached to that. It's attached via a clamp band, which is basically like a banded spring. We'll send a separation signal Great to question. Falcon 9, which will then open up that clamp band, and there will be four springs inside of that payload adapter, bore compression springs that'll give TESS a little gentle push to push it away from stage two. And after a while, a few minutes after that, TESS is gonna turn on its transmitters, on its receivers, deploy its solar arrays, and begin its mission. So let's uh, lo watch these live views for the next four minutes or so, and we'll come back for a live view of payload deploy. Okay, so we have some good questions here. Um, so stage two will go into is in a really elliptical orbit. It means um, right now its lowest point will be that kind of that parking orbit of around what was it 220 or so kilometers above sea level, which is you know 100 basically uh, 120 or so 130 miles above sea level, um, and it's in this really highly elliptical orbit. Um, it's going to stay there until it gets up to apogee. Then it's going to kick itself out, or maybe it'll go back down to perigee and kick itself out into. Uh, solar orbit. Um, yeah, instead of deorbiting itself into the atmosphere, it's basically just kicking itself and throwing itself away. Um, also, uh, Richard, I, I need to answer your question real quick about Paul Allen's straddle launch. So the straddle launch is really cool. They built the biggest wingspan, largest aircraft ever. It'll be flying a pretty decent sized rocket on it. I just, air launches are cool. They're, don't get me wrong, but 
there's something about them that I, I... I don't like the idea, A, that you have basically a giant bomb next to people all the way up on ascent, uh, fully fueled and stuff. It just seems like there could be something that goes wrong there. I mean, I hope not, obviously. Um, but I also don't like the idea that you have to let go of that and then hope it ignites. There's no chance to catch it again. Like, how many times do rockets sit on the pad and kind of they hold on to make sure the engine's okay and then they let go? Um, this is the opposite. You let go and then you hope the engine turns on. That's my biggest, like, complaint, I guess, with air launch. Uh, but their air launch has a lot of other... You get about 3% more efficiency um, by getting it out of the atmosphere, a lot of the atmosphere, and by going relatively quick. You can do any inclination from anywhere. It's pretty cool. Um, that's a... Also signal Mauritius. Good job, Jalen. Um, NASA loves to hide stuff, man. You're right. Even though it's all public domain and you can just look at whatever they're doing. They definitely want to hide that uh, Nibiru and anti-gravity. That's definitely what they um, Oh, drowning. Sorry, that music was too loud. Huh? I apologize, guys. <laughs> um... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was too loud. Did you guys hear anything about the strata launch? I forget that that music doesn't turn down automatically. Um, uh, yep. They, it's true. We did have an update on, uh, we did have an update on Northrop Grumman, Grumman being the one that had the issue with the payload adapter. Um, yeah, it happens. It happens. Uh, don't I think Virgin Galactic have become obsolete in light of what Blue Origin and SpaceX are doing? Um, I don't think obsolete. Uh, I just hope that Virgin, Virgin Galactic really... Oh. ...gearing up for spacecraft deploy. That'll happen in about a minute. This is where we're going to separate the test spacecraft from Falcon 9. And Tesla gonna, is going to go on about its own journey, where it's going to be using its own onboard propulsion systems to raise its altitude and get it into its mission orbit. We'll be getting acquisition of signal as we pass over a ground station here shortly, and ideally we'll be able to see this signal, live on the screen. And there we go. It's good timing that they are over a ground station now and can get us the feeds again. <laughs> In just under a minute here, we'll be seeing the spacecraft separate from Falcon 9. Okay, then all we'll do now is basically un it releases some springs push the satellite out, and the satellite's good to go. And the satellite will actually get a gravity assist around the moon. You can see them venting out more oxygen. That is so cool. Um, yeah, it's going to get a gravity assist around the moon, which will raise its lowest point and get into this really cool orbit. It's a really, really interesting orbit. That beautiful image of the Earth behind us there. It's one of the planets Tess is going to look at in its lifetime. <laughs> there it goes. And as you can see there, we have had successful separation Space of the Tess done. spacecraft. And it's going on on its beautiful mission to look at thousands of planets outside of our solar system. And with that, that brings us to an end of our webcast. As Falcon 9's, Falcon 9's job is done for today. So this was a pretty successful mission, right? We had a successful stage one ascent and landing. Stage two has properly deployed to test spacecraft into its intended orbit and TESS is now on its way and hopefully we'll hear soon about the health of the, the payload. I want to give a big thank you to the NASA Launch Services Program for their faith in us, to Goddard Space Flight Center, to MIT, and to the 45th Space Wing for their range support for today's mission. You can follow SpaceX on social media via our Twitter feed, as well as our Instagram. You can also check us out on SpaceX.com. And if you want to learn more about the test mission, visit NASA.gov. Thank you all so much for joining today, and we'll catch you at the next launch. Sweet. Good job. Good job, SpaceX. Good job, NASA. Congratulations. Huge success. I love it when that's the case. Um, don't forget, guys, test was manufactured actually by Northrop Grumman. Uh, so hopefully everything goes well. I, I like Northrop Grumman. I really want them to do well. Uh, they are, they've, they're a legacy. I mean, they've built some incredible things. So, um, hey, thanks, Tormi. Uh, you have a good night in Norway. That was a great mission. That was perfect. 
Um, so yeah, that switch over to NASA's feed. Um, I, I'm actually going to head out of here soon because don't forget, I will be live streaming tonight uh, for today-ish in space flight history. Um, that will be a lot of fun. So join us, um, 845 Central. I don't remember the time that is, uh, probably like, what is that? Maybe 145 UTC, maybe 245. I don't know. Probably middle of the night for most of you, <laughs> but yeah. Um, join us tonight. It'll be, uh, the music. Well, I, I kind of, I cut the music. Sorry. Um, cause it's going to be over. Um, Will this be the fastest reused test to CRS 15? Is CRS 15 going to be? Oh, yeah, you're, that's what it is. Yes, CRS 15 will not be Block Five. I don't think. I believe it'll be this. They're reusing this booster, um, and I think that will be their quickest turnaround. So we will see. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. I, this is a really really cool mission. Um, I'm I can't wait for it to get online. I think it'll start actually turning on its systems in like five or six days. And start doing some work. Um, I can't wait. It's going to be an awesome, awesome little planet hunter. Um, yeah. So this was this was non-block five. Uh, I don't have enough confidence to call it anything other than that these days, just because it's all so confusing. Um, but yeah. So guys, remember, um, did I ever finish building the Kerbal BFR or the KFR? Kind of. I don't know. I've built like a bunch. Who knows? Um, I did talk about Balloon Party twice. Just rewatch the live stream, unfortunately. Um, I don't want to keep bringing up the same topic over and over. Um, <laughs> yeah. Tesla. Uh, yeah, it's probably anti-gravity. That's how they get ludicrous mode down to uh, 2.39 seconds on the P100D and approximately 1.8 seconds in their upcoming Roadster. I'm probably, you're, you're probably right. Probably anti-gravity. That makes sense. Not just normal physics that we all can obey. Um you're a huge fan. Told your friends about you. Well, thank you, Jackie boy. Um, <laughs> oh, all right. Well, thank you guys. Um, I'm going to get ready to head out here because remember, I will be live streaming again already in two hours from right now. That's that's how you know. I don't know what time it is where you live. Two hours from right now, I will be back online. We are going to be doing today-ish in space flight history, which is where I recreate a historic moment in, in Kerbal Space Program and explain that mission that historic mission to my friend, Jacob EQ, who knows nothing about space. And it's a lot of fun. He asks a lot of terrible questions, but they aren't terrible because you might as well ask and learn rather than to not ask at all. And that's literally his job is to ask and learn. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So be sure and tune in. Um, I will be posting this up afterwards too, as well. 145 UTC. Thank you, Toby. And yeah, if you guys want to help, uh, make sure you're following along uh, here on on YouTube. So subscribe here. Uh, make sure you're following me on Twitter, Everyday Astronaut, or just search Everyday Astronaut, or everywhere Everyday Astronaut anywhere else like Instagram. Um, yeah, I try to keep pretty well updated. Uh, f so follow along. But also, if you want to help support what I do, uh, I owe a huge shout out to those people that do do this. Please visit Patreon.com/slash Everyday Astronaut. Those contributions are what literally allow me to continue to do this stuff so huge thank you to those people they also get exclusive access to discord they get exclusive access to a lot of behind the scenes things like secret mission uh we have a great community and i couldn't be doing this without the amazing people that are already patreon members so thank you thank you thank you thank you to you people um i will be back on in two hours um i hope you guys have a fantastic night i sure am uh i am ready i am ready for this so everyone take it easy that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, everybody. I think we all dreamt about going to space when we were kids. But when the space shuttle program ended in 2011, I discovered a void in my life. That emptiness led to a newfound obsession with space. A few years later, I wound up bidding on a Russian spacesuit as a joke. When the box arrived at my doorstep, my friends asked, what are you gonna do with a spacesuit? The answer, what can't I do with a spacesuit? That's how Everyday Astronaut was born. Since then, the suit hasn't left my side. It's even gone around the world with me. From remote villages in Myanmar, rockets and spaceships, beautiful fields in Norway, 
way out to get a picture right now. Here I am on vacation in the beautiful Norway with my beautiful boyfriend. I even proposed to my wife in the suit at Machu Picchu in Peru. These days I've worked with leaders in the space industry to create fun and inspirational content. I've even been invited to different NASA facilities across the country, all for the sake of sharing my excitement with the world. Hey there, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware, but NASA is doing some incredible things. This is, this is church for us space nerds. This is where Gene Kranz was sitting when people first met him. This is with permission. I still don't know how. I love that I'm standing on something that says urine bags. This thing's gonna fly like a cat and eat. Whatever that means. That dog's gonna have a sore throat by the end of the day, I'll tell you that. Especially once he tries to explain to his friends that he just saw an astronaut flying majestically through the sky for an hour. This thing has officially become the bane of my existence. Everyday Astronaut's mission is to bring space down to Earth for everyday people, to communicate science through humor and imagination, but most importantly, to spark your curiosity to want to find your place in the cosmos. Join my adventures as I seek to find out why exploring space is important, inspiring, and quite frankly, really, really neat. Show your support by visiting patreon.com slash everydayastronaut.